So let's be clear, I am still riding a high from last week and getting the Ferrari fired up. And all of your support and excitement in the comments of the last episode make this incredible moment that much better. So thank all of you guys. I am still beyond words with excitement. I said in the last episode that what I wanna do for this one is focus on getting the cooling systems wrapped up so we can fill them with water and coolant and run this thing for more than you know 45 seconds. We can actually get a taste of how it's gonna run once we start tinkering with things and slapping some keys on the keyboard. Problem is, my weekend was not productive. All I did was hit roadblocks and snags. I got nothing of consequence completed. I'm gonna show you guys what kind of problems I've been running into. We're gonna see what we can get accomplished today. I'd like to try to wrap up at least the intercooler plumbing system, but the engine cooling system, I've gotta order some parts. Let me show you how it's working out. With all of the excitement towards getting the Ferrari up and running, it's been a little while since we've actually looked at the cooling system of the car, and we do have a few loose ends to tie up. We've got an intercooler that needs some water ports so that we can actually fill it with coolant. Not to mention the fact that we've also got some coolant lines that we have to make both fore and aft. For those that haven't seen, the Ferrari has two separate cooling systems, a radiator for the engine and one for the intercooler because we're using a water to air intercooling system. There's a second radiator tucked below the first one known as a heat exchanger, and we need to get both of them plumbed. But before we can do anything, we need to remove the intake manifold so that we can have access to the back side of the engine. It's blocking our access to the water pump and to the water inlet on the block. And with access, we can make the final hose needed to finish out the engine's cooling system. After removing the intake piping and disconnecting the fuel hoses, the plenum comes on out and we can make that final hose. As with the rest of our plumbing, I'm using Vibrant Performance's hose ends, and for this particular job, I'm using Dash 20 hardware. It's the largest that's readily available, and it should maximize the flow of coolant front to back. In this case, though, we're only making this stubby little AN hose, and to install it, we've got to change one fitting that we built several episodes ago. After shortening it, all that should be left is to install it. However, I've been trying to get this hose installed for well over an hour, and it is not going well. The hose is the right length, but there's a bit of a problem getting into place. The first of which is the fact that if you've never worked with AN fittings, you have to get them perfectly lined up in order to install them, and that's not really working out. Let me show you. Now, if we look down here in the engine, you'll see our newly shortened fitting installed right here, and this is where coolant enters the engine. We had to shorten it so that that 90 degree fitting would clear the starter, otherwise we simply can't fit it into this space. That hose needs to go down to this fitting way down here, that brassy colored one. And that's pretty simple other than the fact that if you notice, they are not in plane with each other. They're slightly offset, and that means that the hose needs to jog a little bit in order to get on. The problem is, is that this hose is made of braided stainless steel, so it's not really going to flex much at all. And you can't get AN fittings on unless they are perfectly lined up. Now don't get me wrong, yes we can get that hose on, it is the right length, and this is possible. But it's hard to reach, it's hard to access, and if I'm struggling this much with all the time in the world, I don't want to encounter an annoying problem trying to get this hose on or off in the future when I actually need to service this thing. Whether it's I have to pull the engine, or I have to service the water pump, or need to swap out of the coolant, who knows what. If I'm at the racetrack, this would drive me crazy. And I think this is a sign that I'm not working towards the right solution. This isn't the way to do this. I know everything else is braided stainless and AN fittings, but this hose doesn't really wanna be. So what are our solutions? Well, one, I'm thinking I could build a hard line to go here. That would solve pretty much every problem as long as I can make it somewhat easily disconnectable. And I think if I use some AN unions, that should be possible. The other answer though is I could just run a push lock fitting and put a rubber radiator hose on it. It's not as fancy, it's not as high tech as everything else, but it's serviceable and it allows for a lot of movement, which this braided short hose doesn't. And if the engine moves and rocks, I might wish I had that flexibility there. As you can see, a push lock fitting is still an AN fitting, but it's meant for a rubber hose instead of braided stainless line. That means that instead of normal AN line that's tough to manipulate, we can use normal rubber radiator hose with AN fittings like this one. We can throw a hose clamp on it and it should solve all of our problems, minus the fact that it's not as pretty. But you can't see it once it's installed on the car, so I think this is the right solution. The only downside is I don't have dash 20 90 degree push lock fittings, so I've gotta order them. We can make progress on the intercooler though. 
I showcased in a previous episode that we need to weld on these Dash 16 bungs so that we can actually attach hoses to the end tanks. I had mentioned at the time that I wasn't really excited about welding these on myself. This intercooler is front and center in the engine bay, and all the welds need to look really good, and I am an amateur at best. However, I'm feeling more confident than ever before, and so I figured why not give it a try? You can't learn otherwise, and what's the worst that happens, really? The first fitting was straightforward, but the second one, as you can see, doesn't actually fit in the hole that I had drilled previously. So I used some aluminum welding wire and built a little jig to hold it up into place using some spring tension, as I couldn't use magnets or clamps to hold it and still get access to weld it. And honestly, it worked way better than I expected it to. I was able to tack the part into place without it moving, and then simply pull the welding wire up and out of place. If I had used something else, I was worried it would get stuck inside of the intercooler and impede water flow. The outcome wasn't too bad either. Again, I'm no pro, but I do feel like I'm getting better and better with each and every aluminum weld that I do. And I'm happy to see improvement every time I pick up the torch. So for the TIG welders out there that want to learn, stick with it. At this point, we can call the intercooler done, barring any leaks and ignoring the fact that I have to make some mounts for it. But let's get this thing installed and build some hoses to fit. All right, so I'm gonna do my best to explain some of the constraints that we're working with. But if we look right here, there's a tunnel that runs through the middle of the car and that's where I have our intercooler coolant lines running. And the problem is, is if we look right here, we've got this fitting and the problem is this fitting won't fit through that hole and neither will the fitting on the other end. So we have to assemble the line on the car and what we're gonna do to give ourselves as much length as possible is feed this fitting forward as far as we can. I want to try to hold the camera. Up against the tube so that way we have as much slack as possible at the front. So now let's head up to the front, cut it up, install a fitting, and get this whole thing finished up. And here at the front we can see the tube that those hoses are running through. And before we did anything, I made some marks of where I wanna cut it. We're gonna cut it on this line here, and it's going to hop into this fitting that we installed here. So let's do our best to cut and install a fitting on this on the floor under the front of the car. Now I won't lie, assembling AN lines, especially big ones under the car is about as not fun as it gets, but thankfully this went as smooth as it could. And now the intercooler plumbing at the front of the car is finished. Here you can see we've got our hoses connected to the heat exchanger, both at the top and the bottom, the feed and the return, and they successfully route to the tube through the middle of the car. All that's left is to do the exact same thing at the back of the car to the other hose, although thankfully this time we don't have to be underneath it. I can work over the fender and get this job done nice and easily. With the hoses done, we can install them and the entire package can be considered finished. Again, minus some mounts. But for now, I can sit here and we can operate the car without too much trouble. And I'm really happy the way that it's turning out. But there is one other aspect we need to finish before we can put the manifold back on. If we take a look at the cylinder head right next to where the intake manifold attaches, you'll see two holes right next to the intake runners. The bigger is an EGR port, and we can ignore it, but that small, relatively unfinished one is a coolant port, and we need to solve that because if we were to run the car as it is, coolant will come gushing out. My intake manifold came with this adapter fitting, and it's meant to direct coolant from that port down to the thermostat housing to circulate coolant through the head while the thermostat is closed. We're not running a thermostat though, because we have an electric water pump, and so running this fitting is more or less useless. We could cap it, but I'm not really happy with that kind of bootleg solution. So instead, I turned to TrackTuff for their block off plate. Rob at TrackTuff was really helpful in confirming that I could indeed block off this port without any ill effects. It's close enough to the water outlet on the cylinder head that it shouldn't cause any issues, but thankfully this is easily reversible if I want to change it in the future. I had to machine a little spacer due to some differences in how this is installed, but job done. We can start filling this with coolant once we have our final hose. We do need to modify our intake manifold gasket though. As you can see, there are provisions for those two ports that we're trying to solve. The simple answer is to simply cut it off. So I'm gonna lay some tape down on the bandsaw surface and then attach the intake manifold gasket to it so that I don't score anything and ruin our seal. I know where to cut because I drew a line on the gasket while it was installed on the car. 
And with everything cut, I can shave the edge, clean it up, and as you can see, we've got a nice intake manifold gasket that fits a whole lot better. Technically, we could just use a K20 intake manifold gasket, but I had this one already and this was a bit easier. I can't install the intake manifold until I get those push lock fittings tomorrow, so let's take a look at the oil filter housing that I've been waiting to show you guys for months. Now that we've got the engine running, I can show you exactly how it functions and why it's beneficial. You can see that we've got oil sitting in the top of it now that we've actually run the car, and thanks to a Schrader valve attached to the side of it, we can actually pressurize the housing, pushing the oil down into the filter below. This gives us a good view of the screen element, and in this case, the fact that there is no bearing material at all. This is a good indicator that the engine is in great health. We're waiting on parts to finish the cooling system though, so let me show you what I purchased over the weekend. What we have here is a 1985 BMW 325e that has spent its entire life in California and only has two previous owners. It's got some miles on it and the paint isn't perfect, but it's completely rust free and has some really solid bones to it. I've been hunting for an early model white Etta Coupe for quite a minute now, so I had to jump on this one when it popped up for sale. Now I know tons of you guys are thinking, what are you doing buying another car? No, this is not what I would call a project. I mean it is, but it's not that project. This isn't the one we've been talking about. I picked this up last weekend, we drove it down uh, from Santa Rosa. I recorded it. I'm gonna do a whole kind of series around this car and it's important to me because if you guys remember back in September I mentioned that one of the best friends I've ever had, Corey Hutchison, passed away and he had two of these early model white coupe Ettas with the exact same interior. This is a carbon copy of his car and I wanna tribute this car to him. I wanna build something in his honor and I'm gonna tell you guys his story. I've been putting together some clips. So in the next week or two, expect some content about one of the best people I've ever known and what we're gonna be doing to this car. It's nothing crazy. It's not a major project. We're not getting distracted. It's just something that I need to do for me and I think it's gonna be a bunch of fun. I think you guys will enjoy it too. I do have a couple of other updates, or I guess at least one major update. You'll notice uh, this right here. That's right, shirts are here. That's the only teaser you get. Probably two weeks, I'm gonna guess. Two weeks before I have everything ready uh, to put these up for sale. Uh, the Patreon supporters will get first access, uh, and then it's open the floodgates. You'll have to get them while they're hot. I'm excited to show you guys when the time comes. Be patient, but they're officially here. It's happening. Thank you guys for supporting me for all this time. And last but not least, let's talk a little bit about what else the 308 needs that's large. I mean, obviously we're chipping away at the drive line, but as you guys know, and plenty of you guys have been asking, we need wheels. Now I sent some wheels out to have some custom halves made. The problem is there are supply chain issues. They can't get the material to actually custom make the halves that we need. So we're kind of in limbo. Lots of you guys have asked, why don't I come up with a different solution, something off the shelf? Why am I doing custom wheels when I could bend or break one on the track, et cetera, et cetera? Well, this is a pretty odd car. I don't know if you noticed, but nothing off the shelf is gonna fit this car. We're gonna need a custom solution one way or another. Once we have our first set of custom wheels, we can confirm that we have all the sizing right. We can order some you know, others. We can figure out exactly what's gonna work, so on and so forth. It's the long way around the barn, but it's the way that I wanna do it. So we're sitting waiting on wheels. I might have an interim solution. I should know in the next week or so. I'll keep you guys in the loop. But wheels are the big thing right now. I need wheels so that we can get this car on the ground, finish out the suspension, get axles in this thing, and really just start finishing it out. Finishing everything that we need to get done in order to take it for that first drive. And then eventually we've got to paint it and get it out on track, so on and so forth. There's a lot left to this build, but I feel like we're making some really good milestones. I'm having a blast with it. I'm more motivated than ever. Thank you guys to all the new subscribers. Thank you to all the subscribers that have been here since day one. This project has been so much fun. I'm so excited to share it with you guys. I'm excited for the next episode to come. We'll see what happens at the end of the week. I have no idea yet. I don't plan that far in advance. So I'll catch you guys then. Thanks as always for the support. Mm -hmm.